Good morning. Welcome back to the Industry 4.0 and Sustainable Supply Chain stage here at COGEX. I am Katz Keedy. I'm the CEO of Beep and the founder of Frontline Live. And I am your MC for this stage for this final day. We have had the most fascinating and insightful conversations over the last couple of days. And I'm expecting today's to be better still, no pressure. In a second, I'm gonna hand you over to Rukmini and her panel will be talking about tracking the future. How can 4.0 tools revolutionize supply chains? Asset tracking is more important now than ever. How can it help businesses to get it right during this crazy crisis? How do labs protect the assets that they've been developing for years? How do we deal with social distancing? How do we know where things are to make sure we're most efficient? So with all of that, I'm gonna hand you over to our moderator for this panel, Rukmini Prashad from the Digital Catapult. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on today's webinar on tracking the future. My name is Rukmini Prasad and I'm an IoT product and partnership manager at the Digital Catapult. The Digital Catapult is a research and technology center whose aim is to accelerate the early adoption of advanced digital technologies in the UK. We do this particularly within the manufacturing and creative industries, working with both industry and startups alike to intervene when we see market failure and develop innovative and exciting proofs of concept and accelerator programs to drive the use of exciting new technologies in the UK ecosystem. We also have a strong research and development department, which works to submit bids in a number of exciting areas. Joining me on today's panel are representatives from organizations we've had an opportunity to collaborate with in the past. So it's my pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Joe Hansaker, CEO at Elements Technology, offering software solutions, helping the manufacturing industry to digitize their production with tracking and recording. Marco De Silva, MD at GLOC Systems, a company providing innovative asset tracking solutions in the logistics industry. Ali Miller, CCO at CoolZone, offering monitoring sensors used in healthcare, hospitality, and many other industries. And Neil Ryan, CEO of VRM Technology, an organization developing smart software solutions, helping to decrease the cost and increase energy efficiency in the built environment. In our discussion today, we explore how IoT and future networks can provide solutions to real world problems for various industries. We will discuss asset tracking and condition monitoring, the importance of these new solutions and innovations in these trying times, and how it can help businesses stay afloat and efficient. It's worth bearing in mind when we say asset tracking, we are referring to knowing the geographical location as well as status and utilization patterns of your key assets. Also, when we say asset, we don't just mean a piece of machinery or a cog in your supply chain, but really anything of importance to you. As per the title of today's webinar, an asset could be medicine, large containers at sea, people within your factory, or even public bins within your city. So, Asset tracking is about knowing the status of an item that is of importance to your organization. Please remember to submit any questions you have on the chat function on your screen, and we will cover these off during the Q&A. So to open up today's discussion, I'd love to ask my host of panelists, what is the most exciting thing about asset tracking and how do you feel it can truly transform businesses in today's world? Please talk me through an exciting use case or case study from our organization to bring this to life. Um, I'll start with you, Joe. Okay, yeah. So um, for us, we we kind of go down the order tracking side of things more than asset tracking, but it does still allow you to track probably your two biggest assets, so what your staff are doing, but also what the products are along the chain. So I'll, I'll use the example of Carpenter Additive, um, who we've got in uh, Witness. Um, so during lockdown, they've been able to actually start production uh, remotely. So they've had their office-based staff working from home and they've been able to um, start orders. And then those orders will then um, be completed in the factory 
by the production staff who are on site and then everybody else in the office can still work from home so what it's meant is they can actually keep going really without much disruption um so yeah that that's our really cool use case for us it's that understanding of kind of understanding what's happening where it's happening uh, who's doing what and when so it's building that picture building that story of really what's happening in a factory and i think across industries that's what you're trying to do you're trying to build a picture trying to gain an understanding on things that you might not be able to otherwise brilliant thanks joe um actually it might be good to set a bit of context just a one-liner around order tracking if you can yeah so um yeah going back to that that idea of building the question so for me um as we explained in the kind of the mass class we did last week um between order and asset tracking you're trying to identify um what's happened when it's happened who's done it and where so you're asking yeah and um what asset tracking is doing in large part is you're thinking about the location but order tracking really fills in those other three questions um so most people in manufacturing would know it as barcode or RFID. Uh, we use contactless technology to do it. Um, and there's other technologies uh, knocking around. Uh, but order tracking is that idea of really, um, yeah, tracking an order as you go along. Um, and in other industries, again, um, it, it's just completing that picture by adding extra information in. Um, and it in the most basic way, it means that you can historically look back and see what's been done. But now with digitization, it allows you to see what's going on currently. Um, so it just allows you to gain that understanding um, of what's happening in your facility or in your facilities or, or whatever, really, depending on what your situation is. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. I'll now go to Ali. please. Hi, um, um, I'm Ali. Um, so to answer your question, um, uh, for us, an example, um, how has this helped within, with, with, with the COVID uh, situation? Well, one of the things is that it's, uh, our system is, of course, allows touch-free monitoring. So you, don't, you, know, you can't go into anywhere and touch things. I was in the chemist the other day, and you're not allowed to pick up anything unless you're going to buy it. Um, so um, it allows you to monitor your devices without actually any, going anywhere near them, not even being in the building. So in terms of touch-free monitoring for safety, in terms of being um, able to monitor remotely from your home working environment or your assets, um, then that's what our system does. It allows you to predict failure. It looks at your energy use. Um, and so a lot of these units that we have, um, you know, if they're not in use, their behavior changes when they're not in use. If you're talking about medical, biomedical um, equipment, um, they can um, consume an awful lot more energy. They can fail. So we're looking at everything around energy um, and power detection as well to make sure that essential assets, which could be medicines, which could be food, which could be um, anything really that you need to track, um, make sure that they're kept safe. Um, the um, example, an example of, um, of some of the things that we've done during lockdown um, in the food market, there's one of the major pasta manufacturers um, in the UK um, who supplies some of the very large supermarkets. And we all know how we, how we couldn't get pasta in the beginning. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and they had to up their production. Um, and so suddenly they become a customer of ours. They wanted to, they suddenly rang us. We said, we need, we need to, we need to get your equipment in there. We're looking at monitoring, um, energy. We're looking at, um, temperature, humidity, all these kinds of things. Um, in the biomedical world, we've got customers who have never, uh, sites in America who've never met us, um, heard of us, never met us. Some of these are, um, are, um, uh, um, uh, storage of biomedical uh, samples other people are collectors of biomedical samples so people where they have uh, patients going in and collecting plasma and all kinds of things for research um we've never met them they've heard of us they could they're struggling and they've placed orders and we're shipping we've shipped equipment out to them and they will just self-install so um not only does our system help but in this environment where you can't actually go and put the system in for them the fortunate thing about for us is that we've designed our system so that it truly is plug and play um, in a way that people talk about, but sometimes it's not easily achieved. So mm -hmm. all they need is a 13 amp plug, they can monitor all kinds of um, um, information from their assets. Great, thank you, Ali. 
I'll now go over to you, Neil. And um, well, I guess in our business, we track energy. So for us, that means tracking assets, the state of assets, how they're used, and what they're consuming, what people are doing. So people for us are still assets in it as well. So we're always looking to see, you know, is something abnormal compared to what it should be or how it should be measured. So for us, I guess asset tracking gives the ability to fill in the blanks. So data that might not be there, data that might not be digitized already, you know, whether you're just digitizing an asset that exists or you're adding IoT sensors on top to measure extra information about that asset, that's the sort of power that this suddenly creates because now I can see trends, I can visualize the data, I can apply data science models on top of it. I can really see what my true cost operating costs are, my future costs, predictions about things that haven't even happened yet. And I can look back at old data from my assets to see what's likely to happen based on what, what happened then. Did somebody have to go out and fix things, et cetera, because my energy bills were too high. Um, so for us, it's, it's kind of the power that this data suddenly brings to life. And, and that's what's really exciting. And for our clients, their local authorities, always looking to lower their energy costs for their tenants. And they've thousands of properties out there. And uh, so this is something that brings kind of, it's a really exciting time for them and for us. Great. Thank you. And uh, last but by no means least, I'll go to you, Marco. <laughs> Hiya. Um, well, I guess we are on the the, the end of this, this, the chain of it because we do asset trackers um, for uh, transport companies. And obviously, in, in times like this, it's important to know where your, in this case, your trailers are um, so uh, you can manage your fleet effectively. Um, as as an example, we we were working with a with a local company, which they've got around seven hundred plus um, trailers, and even in times in times like this, it's quite important because they were still renting out trailers when they had some um, around around the corner. But again, they haven't had any visibility of their of their entire fleet, so that was costing them more money. Um, while now with our self-sufficient tracking device um which it's a low cost solution it's low cost on installation as well um because it's self-powered um they are able to manage uh, their fleet effectively so you know if they want a specific type of trailer they will know instantly where it is um and and these have been a massive help uh, cost wise for uh, for them and also understand the behavior of their fleet, where they move in, where they go in, and and all those those things. Yes. Great. Thanks, Marco. Um, so I think one thing that's come up across those answers really on the board has been around customer experience and how it helps your end users, be that your direct customers, the local authorities, the medical supply chain, or even the end users of, of those solutions. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. How does asset tracking truly make the experience for the end user better? So I'll go to you, Neil, and to you, Ali. So Neil, uh, I'll head to you first. Um, it, well, it's all down to each client, I think. So what are they trying to achieve? So is it a continuation of supply? So for instance, uh, during COVID, less people can go and repair things, less people are available. And so remote diagnostics is something that's really important. So that, that's one thing that's having the data available virtually anywhere you need to have it and in the right format. And the second thing maybe is cost. So for our clients, it's cost is a big factor. So at the end of the day, sometimes the tenants pay, sometimes the local authorities pay and being able to budget and keep control of those costs and easily pinpoint where you can make the biggest savings with the least amount of investment. And I think that's what this type of data can give to them um, or we look to give to them at least. And what's the user experience for the local authority in this case? Is there sort of a, a heat map they can see of energy across their various buildings? Yeah, because a lot of this is new as well. So uh, like sometimes you're at risk of, you know, giving them a car and they don't have a driving license, for instance. <laughs> so you have to be wary of what they can do and how they can consume that information. So for us, it's very much a managed service. So feeding the information that's really relevant around, these are the things that are wrong. This is what you need to do to fix it. And that, instead of looking at a graph or charts, et cetera, mm -hmm. that might mean nothing to them. So it's sort of piecemeal and know your customer type of approach. I think that's important here. Okay, brilliant, thanks. And Ali? Um, 
So your question is about what the experience is like for them. Yes, is that is that correct? how does how does the end user in in your case be that the pharmaceutical companies or in fact their end users, those who actually use the pharmacy uh, and and the medical equipment, how do they benefit from an asset tracking solution along the supply chain? Well, um, okay, so you know we are in. Um, uh, we're across industry, so I've mentioned medicine, we're in food, we're in food equipment manufacturing. Um, so the um, the key thing is that um, for, for them, I think, is that they they have a lot of things that they want to monitor, a lot of key, key metrics that make a difference to their business in terms of reducing costs, um, uh, providing um, continuity, continuity of service and so on. And um, so for us, that uh, means that sometimes what they're monitoring is on the move. Um, if you think about the, uh, the cold chain in medicine and in food, um, you know, there are a lot of people who handle these products along the way. And being able to monitor this, these products um, all the way through the chain is, is really important. Um, and people um, uh, discover things that they didn't know. I mean, as a basic example, if you take temperature again, People will think that they're cooling to um, uh, to minus 20 to keep something safe um, in the food. We've 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 dealt with some large um, uh, 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 fast food uh, organisations who maybe think that some vital food that uh, it should be kept at minus 20 is actually the average temperature over a period of three months might be more like minus 11. Uh, we've got people who think that they're cooling things on their service contract or to keep it safe to minus 15, and they're cooling to minus 30. Um, when they're when you're on when you when you then start to to move and and have a distribution channel then there are gaps in that that people may not know what's happening so we with our system you can monitor statically you can monitor mobile um, and we also log all the history um, so even if you do happen to lose connection all of the you're using a cellular connection the whole cellular network goes down which I don't know whether any of you experienced but during this COVID time which has been very challenging some of the networks um, then we log all the history and that's automatically recovered. So, um, so the, we, we're just pay, basically providing peace of mind. An awful lot of people are so relieved when they've got our system. People existing customers are so relieved they've got our system. It's allowed them to keep working. Um, new customers um, are delighted that we've been able to supply to them in this period. Um, and so it gives them peace of mind. It lets them know what's going on. It lets them change their business practices to adapt to this new world using fewer people, um, optimize processes, um, and so on, because it provides them an insight into really what's going on. Great, thank you so much. I think actually leading on from that, we've heard a lot about the benefits now, and I suppose the great things that come with asset tracking, but I'd be interested to hear, um, Joe and Marco, what you think are the main challenges that come with adopting an asset tracking solution? You know, it seems like it's quite apparent to a lot of businesses. You can save time, money, efficiency. Um, what holds businesses back from adopting this technology? Joe, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I, I think to start off, it's understanding the benefits of it. So actually having somebody who understands the technology and understands um, how to use it, it's all well and good kind of putting some technology in, but if you're not using it to solve a problem or to answer a question, it's largely pointless. So one of the things that I, I, I always find really helpful for a company is just trying to find a tech person, just even someone who's just interested to have a play. Um, I think that I think the ability to actually be able to work out a return on investment is another thing. Uh, an unknown return on investment is such a barrier to so many companies. So I think part of that is giving companies the opportunity to have a play around so things like free trials um kind of trial periods i think that allows companies to have a go and from that they can then work out their own return on investment uh, return on investment uh, what else um yeah I, i'd say they're probably the two main things that idea of kind of justifying the cost and then finding the right way to use it um so for example um, so with our free trial, um, somebody uh, bought one or signed up for one, sorry, on Thursday, sent out a package on Friday. Um, and later this afternoon, I'm jumping on a Zoom call to kind of talk through how they can actually use it. 
and their words are, I'm sure this can help us. I'm just trying to find the right way to use it. You actually okay. see the help of understanding how to best fit the technology around their processes, around their current technologies, and rather than it trying to compete with them and make it work together. Actually, that, that is a challenge, but there's always help there, and companies can always help you do that. I'm sure all of us, if, if a customer comes to us and says, well, I'm not really sure um, how to use it. It seems good, but I just need some help. We're all problem solvers, so we're, we're all actually quite enjoy the challenge of, of kind of taking that on. So rather than lifting and shifting the technology into identical kind of uses across multiple businesses, it's really about figuring out, I suppose, the value of the important asset in your organisation and, and kind of adapting the solution to fit that specifically. Yeah, definitely. I'd agree with that, definitely. Brilliant. And Marco, over to you. Yeah, from our perspective, and as Joe mentioned, we always try to get someone that is a bit more techy, because if you approach, you know, um, a fleet manager, for example, that has been in a company for years, um, and you're going to start talking about asset tracking, um, and, you know, where they can locate their trailers and all those things, what they're going to tell you is, oh, I know where all those trailers are, I know where everything is, so you know, why Why do I need, you know, an asset tracking for our trailers when I know all of where, where all of them are at, you know, at one point? Um, so, yeah, so this is one of the f main challenges we we find um, to get into, into companies. Uh, but again, um, we're trying to solve problems and that's why we offer them, you know, free trials. We offer them a few devices so they can, install on on their trailers and see the actual benefit of it um, but yes that is our main main challenge even though we're here to help them because you know that will save them money further down the line uh, as as the example i've mentioned um you know if you have 10 trailers and you know you don't know where one is you're gonna rent out another one so you know it's a it's an added cost to the business and um and i think this is another another problem where companies um are sort of afraid it's, it's not afraid but i think you know what i mean just trying to you kind of creating them problems where they know they exist but they don't want to see they are there <laughs> <laughs> oh oh but that makes sense in a way so uh, so yeah so we try to save you know, to save some money, to show them there's a, a, pro, a kind of a problem in there for them because they're spending more than they actually should. If when they if they manage their fleet effectively, they will need to rent out that that unit. Um, so this is what what our main issues um, with our asset tracking and you know getting into customers, speaking with them to uh, to to get out there. Great. And to add to that as well, what well, I don't know whether you found this, Marco, but often um, a company will say, we're trying to solve these problems or we, we, we want to see these benefits, but there's so many intangibles that they're kind of unaware of until they have a play around. So it's like there's so many part, uh, so many little bits of time wasted unnecessarily. Correct. Still, it's kind of, unless there's something that solves those, they wouldn't have even realised they were there. Um, I'd say there's these big, big time uh, wasting uh, moments. Then there's so many more little time wasting moments. And it's kind of, unless they've got the technology in front of them, they'll, they'll never know they even exist because they're like, oh, normally I would have done this. And like for us, it's, oh, we would have spent like five minutes chasing this order around the factory just to find yeah. out where it's up to. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize that actually I'd be able to stop doing that. And yeah, for me, no. that's a big part of it, the intangibles. Yeah, we, we also have that um, with a customer, Joe, because, um, you know, if you imagine a trailer yard with, I don't know, 100 units, 200 units, and the customer tells me, oh, yes, I know where all my assets are. They're all over there. And you just say, yeah, where is that specific trailer? Oh, we just get someone out there and see where it is. And what if it's not there? Where did you left it? You know, that all those all those things that you know wh where is 
we can add the real value to it and there's your cost saving as well uh, because a person going around the yard two or three times a day for about you know two minutes or five minutes whatever time that is at the end of the month that person you know is at clocking up a few hours where it could be you know a, a completely different task great thanks so much i think i have i think i have a thought off the back of that actually so ali i mean say an organization has kind of ordered their free trials they're sort of giving it all a go what are the main things that these organizations should consider when it comes to adopting new technologies an organization that's at the beginning of its digital transformation journey how can it kind of use these free trials to the best of its ability and really embed the technology within their organization in a meaningful way mm -hmm. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, um, one thing I would say is that we don't, um, we tend not to trial now. We, we did that. We, we, we've been in business quite a few years. We did, we did trial with people, um, and it's an important first stage in, um, in, in, in basically progressing your own company to be able to get your technology out there uh, to as many people as possible and understand um, how what their experience is like. So we've tried to change our technology both in, in, in all kinds of aspects over the years to make sure that um, uh, the adoption is extremely easy um, and the price barrier is, is, is not such that um, you, you have to think long and hard about it. Um, and, and the technical experience you need to start is like not there. You don't need to so you don't need a team of technical people. Um, so, um, so what we tend to do is we tend to um, uh, we'll tend to sell a small system, and we would encourage. So it's like a trial. We we tend to encourage people who don't know where to start just start, just try and think of one area where you think you might have pain, um, or one area where you did, don't think you know what's happening in your business and you think you'd like to, um, and that way they can start. Um, and we've had people you know who've had payback in our system in in like a month. And, and that's not just because that you know, and that's for people that haven't even lost stock or anything. That's just because it allows them to um, to optimize energy use. It allows them to reduce um, staff and focus on other things and and that kind of thing. Um, so the other thing I say is that don't limit yourself to thinking that you just want to um, connect one particular area of your business because once you get in. Um, once you start, it's like a Trojan horse and people just then pay, can you do this and can you do that? And what you don't want to go and do is buy this system for this and another system for this. Um, so um, where we've succeeded a lot, and, and I was just at one of the very large, the, one of the top 10 pharmaceutical biomedical companies um, last week, and who bought a lot of equipment from us in a really amazing uh, facility they've got um, um, up near um, Oxford. And they said one of the reasons that they loved us, they bought from us, is we don't stand still. We're always pushing the boundaries. And although they started with temperature monitoring, they've moved into energy, they've moved into pressure, they've moved into occupancy, they've moved into all kinds of areas with us. And they're looking to do um, vibration, remote monitor. Uh, rem 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 um, they're not using anything in vans at the moment of distribution, which they're going to. Um, and they're looking for us for also monitoring of their critical, some of their other critical systems that they already have systems for, but that are local alarms, um, and we can do secondary monitoring of that. So I think that with a customer, we'd say, um, just get started. Um, don't overthink it. And the, the cost it takes for you to analyze and overthink, you could have put a system in and trialed it. And don't limit yourself to something that is just um, uh, monolithic, and, uh, sorry, a singular, a singular approach to um, monitoring. Look at something that's broad. Great, thank you so much. And Neil, I know you mentioned earlier you've been working with local authorities at VRM Technology. It would be great to hear a bit more about how your solution is kicking in during COVID-19 and how are you helping those authorities keep their local residents connected, safe and with their energy and heating on? Uh, I guess maybe an example might be Croydon Council that we're starting to do a lot of work with. So at the very beginning of it, one of the things that we always try and do with the customer is have something small to start with. So because this is maybe new to them, what's the singular objective that we can look to achieve and um, be clearer on both sides, how we're going to measure that 
uh, what the milestones are um, and how long it's going to take to get there and, and what the end result looks like when you do get there and how you might expand on that. Um, with them, they wanted to get a good assessment of all of the properties that they have and all of the costs to serve those properties in terms of heat. So they use communal and, and district heating. So centralized heating, feeding it out to many properties. And so what we looked to do at the start was, could we gather enough information to show them the state of what that's in now? Uh, how could they do that really cost effectively? And then show them a way to take that to the next stage to start making major savings. So over the course of two months, you start off and you gather the information, you add sensors in. And at the end of the two month period, we define the savings, which in their case should be something like 40%. So quite large savings in terms of energy and cost. And those costs go on to residents. So everybody's worried at the moment around what's gonna happen and are people gonna have enough money? And these residents are tenants, some of them are social housing, some of them are freeholders. So the cost to serve is important to everybody. And um, so whether you're paying for it on their behalf or they're having to pay for it. So, so for us, those type of things, adding tech, adding asset tracking, adding you know, state play in terms of the assets, energy monitoring, all of that feeds in. It's, it's kind of a big melting pot. And the clients definitely would then rely on, on us and I guess our peers there to manage that data and to present it in a format that's really usable and that hits the objectives that I talked about at the start. Great, thank you. And could you provide some more context in terms of the sensors you deploy? What What is the key information that these councils are after? Some of it is around consumption, which is obviously important. So billing systems, uh, notoriously, unless there's maybe smart meters involved, mightn't give you accurate data. For instance, if you need data every 15 minutes. And so they want to get data around heat or energy use or gas consumption really, really quickly. And that's one thing. So you might add simple sensors to a gas meter as an example. If I wanted to know temperature, so what temperature does a resident like to keep their flat at? I'd put in a temperature sensor. I might add in a humidity sensor on the back of that because I want to give them warnings around when, for instance, mold might grow. So you're in a tower block, you've uh, nowhere to hang your laundry, you dry it in your living room, and unless you're opening the windows, which you're probably not doing in winter, you have a good chance of black mold growing, for instance. So adding sensors that give multi-purpose. Um, so monitoring one thing, a state, a temperature, and another thing, which is something that might occur unless something is done. Um, vibration sensors in plant rooms, for instance. Uh, monitoring electricity use in plant rooms would be a, a kind of a constant thing that we look at. So when the electricity goes up in an asset, maybe it means that either the asset isn't functioning properly or it might start to break down in the future. So it's a myriad of things that we look to do, and, and it's not always like for like in every client case because their objectives differ slightly. Mm -hmm. It's not always about money. Sometimes it's about service um, and continuity of service to residents like you talked about. Thanks so much. We've had a few questions come in, and there's one I'd like to talk about in particular I think will be really interesting, which is around data and how do you keep the data secure of all the information that's coming in. So the question we have is, the underlying principle of Industry 4.0 is that all systems are connected to the internet. How do we mitigate the risk of cyber criminals breaking in, taking control? Essentially, how do you within your businesses manage and store the data that's produced and ensure this is kept securely? So Joe, I'd like to go to you and, and Neil as well, because I think obviously the data that you're, you're capturing is really end user data about you know, how people within their homes are living. So it'd be interesting to hear how that's kept securely. So Joe, we'll go to you first and then over to you, Neil. Yeah, so um, so we, we basically done ours to the levels that Rolls-Royce request. And um, so we got a link early doors um, actually through an event um, with Digital Catapult. Um, and we spoke to them and said, if we were to work with either you or your supply chain in the future, what, what levels of um, security would you need? So the first thing was to have a UK based server with one of the major companies. So we've got Microsoft Azure. Um, I think we've got a server and a backup server in the UK. Um, the other, th so there's a two factor encryption um, when you're logging in uh and what else have we got oh the probably the main thing that we do which um so this this is probably one of the key things with all startups so we have an independent pen test so every single little bit of work every time we add new features 
we get somebody independently who tries to break into our systems and get the data. So we um, hire somebody to do that, to basically try and break down our systems. Uh, and then if there's any tiny little um, holes, then we make sure they're blocked and we are secure and we'll retest. So um, I think that's a key thing is, is that independent penetration testing, just making sure that even if there is um, a really, really smart teenager in a bedroom trying to have a mess around and try and break into people's software, that you've done everything you can to make sure that they can't do that. Um, obviously, standard things like HTTPS um, uh, on the website, just lots of little things. I, I couldn't tell you the full details. That would be for, for Pete. Um, but all I know is that, so my CTO, he's he's come from a background working with NHS data, um, Manchester Metropolitan Police, um, what else? banking data so he did autoimmune systems on um atms so in terms of actually making sure our data is locked down i couldn't be more confident um but yeah we've got some pretty pretty standard processes in place for that great thank you joe and, and neil over to you um same type of process exactly except we're on aws uh, that would be the big difference for us and i guess the thing that we spend a lot of time thinking about um, is the data that connects into our system so if we're putting iot sensors in if we're connecting and um, assets up what is that data and making sure it's anonymized so there's no link back to a person and um, try not to make a link back to a place what type of devices do we use? Are they secure? Are they industry standard? If there's any new type of devices out there, um, we test them thoroughly. And uh, so lab testing first. How the comms before our servers happen. So we use LoRa networks, for instance, so wide area networks. So how secure are they? What is the network? Is that a shared network? Is it a private network? Uh, if it's a shared network, what do we have to do to put in place to secure the data along its path until it reaches us? And then when the data leaves us and goes to the client side, because obviously they want to enrich their own systems with some of this information, how secure is that path? Um, you know, whether it's just secure FTP or it's an encrypted web service or whatever it is. And um, so we're always worried around that, apart from just people hacking into us, uh, which is obviously is, is a threat for everybody. Um, but for us, we've been on AWS for eight years. Um, it's based in London, based in Dublin, and it's been great. It's solved, helped us solve a lot of the challenges. Amazon themselves have been great, always stepped up in terms of overviews, recommendations, what we should do. Uh, and then working closely with device manufacturers, that, that's been key for us to learn how to really secure and lock down devices um, and put the extra effort into that. I think clients are willing to pay a little bit more to know that everything is completely secure. Mm. Thanks very much. And Ali and Marco, I had a question for you. How can organizations build a business case for asset tracking? So how can they take this, having gathered all of this information to their board and say, you know, let's go? Uh, Ali, I'll go to you first. Well, I think it's a little bit along the, the conversation that we just had earlier about, you know, how to get started and start, so on. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, we've had people go both ways. We've had people build the build case. In fact, just as a, uh, I've just had an, an email come through just while we've been chatting, was a very large, uh, the largest, Hospital Research Institute in uh, one of the countries in Europe is just, um, you know, going to the next stage of uh, about to place a contract with us and um, have a few uh, final like minor uh, questions to to um, to nail, which we'll do this week. Um, and they started from a very much a top down approach. They did a lot of investigation um, and. Um, uh, and then other people will start small and then the business case, it's like, um, it's and then, you know, I hate to use words, a bit like a virus, you know, when you get in there, it just kind of worms its way through the organization because people can say, I want to do this, I want to do that. And actually having to build a business case kind of goes away because they're getting so much value from what they're doing um, to start off with um, that um, that uh, the, the barriers kind of fall away. So people do it from 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 both ways. I suppose if you're starting to build a business case, you have to have knowledge about what it is you're trying to um, trying to do. You have to know, you have to know uh, where things are going wrong, 
what could be improved, what the cost implications of that are. And therein lies the problem. But yeah, IoT people is so new, and it's pretty new still, and people don't really appreciate what it can do for them. So they might build a business case, but actually once they get started, um, it might not be that valid. Um, so, you know, we've just um, been doing some work. We do a lot, we do work with food equipment manufacturers um, to, um, to connect things that are, uh, connect digital devices and connect de de devices that aren't digital so that they can um, see what's going on in the field and do predictive maintenance and so on. And, um, and in those the beginning of the project, I, I'd say that they didn't really know. But when you start getting involved in it, then they do know. And that's when the business case really starts. I'd say uh, get, get going, experience it, build the business case once you start to get some knowledge. Great. Thanks very much. And Marco, over to you. Yeah, I'll just uh, just got a quick line to say um, pretty much don't be afraid of what you might find um, that you didn't know. Uh, we're here to, you know, obviously to help you out with with your savings and give you savings um again we don't we don't use gsm device so they are not as expensive as you think uh so uh, i would say just go for it just try it and then engage with it because it will help you even you think that it won't and what do you mean when you say you know don't be afraid of what you might find find out. Uh, that, is go, that goes back to the conversation with Joe. Um, those little things, you know, if you think your per, your person A going around the yard, you know, every single day, try to, you know, try to find a specific asset, you know, and that will all add up um, to, you know, you can use that cost to to buy a system They'll give you that by by just clicking on a button pretty much and you know where your asset are. And I think people are afraid to find those things because if you think that person has been doing that for the past 20 years, how much has it cost to the business opposed to have a tracking solution with, which probably costs you a fraction of that person going around and find it. That's what I mean. Great. Thank you so much. So we're just coming up to time now. So I'll just say a big thank you to all my panelists today and for all of you at home watching. Thank you so much for the questions you've submitted as well. So we've got a Q&A session coming up about 15 minutes from now. So there'll be a quick comfort break, um, time for a cup of tea. And then we'll regroup at about 11 and we'll go through some of the questions that have been submitted, which are really interesting. So Hope you can stick around and join us for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much. And thank you again to the panelists. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.